and uh, worked on a uh, documentary, the PFAS program, NOVA uh, produced on that, and have done all kinds of things related to LaBelle. And so tonight I'm going to tell you about this project and the amazing story that we uncovered as we went through this project, from its discovery to learning all the aspects about the ship and the significance of that ship. And I'm going to tell you about how that ship, wrecking in Manicura Bay, changed the course of Texas history. Uh, it's that important for our understanding of where we are today as, as a state. So uh, I'm, the, the project was a project of the Texas Historical Commission. I've worked for that state agency for 24 years. I retired about nine years ago. I'm back now as a commissioner on the Texas Historical Commission, so I'm back with it, so I can legitimately credit myself as being with the Texas Historical Commission. <laughs> so the story begins with this individual, uh, Robert Caballés uh, Sur de La Salle. Uh, if you pick up a history book on La Salle, or on, on North America, there's a section in most of them about La Salle as a great explorer of the Mississippi River and the Midwest and the Great Lakes, and he was all of that. But as part of our, our research into uh, La Salle, and I've been over to France several times, I've looked at original documents that he's written, and you get a more complicated understanding of La Salle, the person. Um, he, he was an arrogant individual, uh, was not very kind to the people that were with him on his expeditions and were working with him. Uh, some evidence suggests he probably was bipolar. And there were three episodes when he had uh, expeditions in the Midwest in, in the wintertime. And he would take off and, and things would reach a point where he had such an argument with the men that were with him and such disagreements that three different times his men tried to kill him by poisoning him by feeding him hemlock. <laughs> and after the third time, he realized he couldn't change that. But what he could do is that he could keep an antidote for hemlock poisoning with him for the future in case he tried that again. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, LaSalle, a very interesting individual, very driven man, uh, famous for explorations he did up in the Great Lakes. Uh, he built the first sailing ship on the Great Lakes, the Griffin. But he's most famous for being the first European uh, explorer to travel the full course of the Mississippi River and discover that the Mississippi River flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Up until this time, the hope was that the, Mississippi, that the main waterway across the North American continent was the Great Northwest Passage that you could go from the Pacific, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Well, the South dispelled that notion and that the major waterway comes to the Gulf of Mexico. And when he did that, he claimed all the land that the Mississippi drained, about a third of the United States, for France. And here you can see this George Catlin painting of La Salle claiming all this land uh, for France with a band of the local Indians there having no idea that La Salle has just taken away the land that they own for untold millennia. <clears throat> so La Salle was very excited about this. And he said, I'm going to go back to France, I'm going to get a commission from King Louis XIV, and I'm come back, going to come back and I'm going to build a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River. This is the first attempt of the French to build what later became the city of New Orleans. And I'm going to then exploit this area for furs and hides, and I'm going to sell those back in France and make a lot of them. The Salle went back to France, and he couldn't get an audience with King Louis XIV. The king was complaining that uh, his colonies, the French colonies in North America, were giving him beaver pelts, and the king of Spain was getting gold and silver. And the king knew that this part of North America didn't have gold and silver, and he didn't want more colonies, he was having to spend money to try and take care of it. La Salle was determined that he wanted to make this new final expedition coming back, he wanted to make it work. And so what he did is what we do today, when we want our government to do something and the government doesn't want to do that, we hire lobbyists. Well, he hired lobbyists. And back in those days, your lobbyists were members of the clergy. And so we hired a couple of members of the clergy that had special favor with King Louis XIV. They got an audience with the king, and the Salle got his commission to come to the New World to set up a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So in 1684, he left this portside town, La Rochelle. <coughs> Uh, and interestingly today, these gates that were there when La Salle sailed through them still exist today. Beautiful uh, part of uh, France. And he set sail with uh, 300 colonists, 100 sailors, and four ships. Two that the king gave him, and two that he leased uh, on his own. 
And he made his way across the Atlantic Ocean, <clears throat> headed for the Caribbean. Before he made uh, landfall here, he lost one of his four ships. Well, St. Francois, pirates came and they captured it. It, got, it was sailing slower than the other ships. He got behind and, and pirates got it and captured it. Uh, and he lost some of his supplies, but not a great deal because it was a small vessel. Now, La Salle had arranged through King Louis XIV, the king of uh, France, to uh, have the governor of the French colony here meet him right up about there. But at sea, La Salle wasn't in charge. Captain Beaujou was the, the man, the captain of all the ships, and he was in charge. And he and the sailors said that we don't want to go and meet the, the governor of the island. We don't care about that. We want to go to a place called Petit Guam. Now, one of the wonderful things about this archaeological project is that we have historical documents to help us understand why these decisions were made. So with Petit Guam, there's a man that came with LaSalle called Henri Choutel, who kept a detailed diary of the whole expedition. And he gives us some clues about Petit Guam. He says in his diary, Petit Guam is a place where the air was bad and the fruit the same. <laughs> and there are a great many women worse than the air or the fruit. <laughs> so you can understand what happened there. And so uh, LaSalle lost out. They spent some time at Petit Guam. And then after a period of time, they uh, continued the expedition for the, to the Mississippi River. And I need to mention some of LaSalle's men infected and became pirates. Oh. And we're going to link back up with those, those men in a little while. So they set sail for the Mississippi River, ending up landing in Texas. How in the world did he miss the Mississippi River <coughs> by hundreds of miles? Well, we're going, to, we're going to get into that. We, we figured that out as part of our, our project. <clears throat> uh, there's two documents that help us understand that. The first is the map that LaSalle made uh, with his map maker after he found the Mississippi River mouth. He made, made a map of Mississippi and North America with his map maker. And then another document uh, is called the Chicago Fragment. And this is a, uh, a document that uh, LaSalle wrote. Uh, where he talks about the Chicago River. And the Chicago River is the name of the Mississippi River that the DeSoto expedition found in the 1530s. And, and he, he, he read that and he talked about the Chicago uh, River. And in, in this document, he talks about his reasoning as to where he thinks his river is. And he concluded that the Chicago River was different than what he found. And so in his map, he has Mississippi River coming on down. And right here, it makes a big turn, goes all the way over into New Mexico, and links up, links up the Rio Grande. And so that's what he thought was going on. And so part of the reason for this, and it's understandable when you really look at it, LaSalle uh, had no idea that the Mississippi River had a delta. So if you take that away, that's his view of the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see that up here. <clears throat> And LaSalle also, in his, that Chicago document, the Chicago Fragment, and it's called a fragment because it's missing the beginning and the ending, but it's LaSalle's handwriting. Uh, and uh, in there he talks about that when he came into the Mississippi, uh, we came out of Mississippi and entered the Gulf, he was going to the east and then the, uh, the southeast. And so in his view of this, the only place that could happen would be way over to the west. And so that's why he thought that the Mississippi River was so much further over there. So what we're going to do now, uh, we're, going to re we're going to follow LaSalle's journey across the Gulf of Mexico and how we ended up at Matagorda Bay. And I'm using actual readings that he was giving as to where he was in the historical documents that we have access to. So he made it around uh, Cuba and he started across the Gulf of Mexico and each little red dot here is a, uh, a latitude and longitude that he recorded from it, was astrolabe. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, so he's shooting for, well, when he discovered the mouth of the Mississippi River, he, he used his astrolabe to say that the uh, latitude was 28 degrees, 20 minutes uh, north. And so that's what he was shooting for. So, again, remember that he doesn't know that there's a delta up here. This is his view of, of, of the Gulf of Mexico. And so he has, as he heads across the Gulf of Mexico, 
he gets there where he sees landfall, he sees uh, land, he's 70 miles from the Mississippi River, but concludes that he's actually over here because of the, the curvature of the, uh, the, the shore. He sees it going that way. And so he continues on. Now he sees the land is, is horizontal. He thinks he's up here going east-west. And then he continues further and he sees the land starting to head towards the uh, southwest and so he's going on down and uh, he realizes he's heading out towards Mexico which were the enemies of, of Spain at the time that he left. He didn't want to go too far down there. And right about there uh, we have four pages of the daily log of the Lobel that exists today in the archives in Seville, Spain. And those four pages, uh, I'll talk a little bit later on that the uh, Osala ends up uh, uh, with the Indians attacking and killing everybody, and they got the log of Lobel. Spaniards found those Indians uh, with the log of Lobel, asked for it. They wouldn't give it to them, but they gave them four pages. And those four pages ended up in the archives in Seville, Spain. But in one page, it's talking about the soundings right there, off the coast where we are here. If you were able to be on the beach, you'd look out there and you'd see the four uh, 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 French ships out there. When they were out there, uh, they're writing in the log that uh, they think they're heading too far to the southwest. They're going further, they're going to encounter the Spanish. And that will be a terrible thing to do. So they decide they have to head back. They're going to go find latitude 28 degrees, 20 minutes. This is it right here. Notice the discrepancy here between the mouth of Mississippi and this. Well, Sal's astrolabe was malfunctioning at the time. He didn't realize it. Okay, so we got an incorrect reading there. Anyways, he heads on back up there. And where is that? Matagorda Bay. That's how we ended up at Matagorda Bay. That's what, uh, why he went there. He thought that was the part of the mouth of the Mississippi River. And when he was there, he actually wrote a couple letters saying that he was at a branch of the mouth of the Mississippi River. And he's writing these, these letters that ultimately made their way back to the king of France. <coughs> so La Salle, uh, let's see. There we go. he offloaded some of his supplies. He established our first uh, European uh, settlement in uh, this part of Texas, Fort St. Louis, up near towards Victoria, Texas. And then he tried to bring in uh, one of his big, his big supply ship, the Mob. It wrecked uh, outside at uh, Pascadillo. It's still out there today uh, for some future archaeologists to discover and excavate. Uh, a uh, third ship, Le Jolly, had orders to offload supplies and, 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 and soldiers and to sail back to France. And it did that. So in 1685, when he was in Matagorda Bay, he was down to a single ship, La Belle, as his lifeline, uh, if he needed to get supplies or help, whatever he might need. <clears throat> so La Salle was at Fort St. Louis, his calling. He said, I've got to find the Mississippi River. That's my, my uh, uh, orders from the king. I know it's in, not any further to the southwest. It's got to be to the, to the uh, north, northeast. And uh, or north and, and you know, somewhere directly north, and that uh, he needs to uh, locate that, and then he's going to move everybody over to the mouth of the Mississippi River. And he thinks that I'm at a branch of the mouth of the Mississippi River, so it should be an easy thing to do. And so his goal is to take LaBelle up here in Madagorda Bay, uh, anchor it with 27 people on board. He'll go overland, find the Mississippi River, come back. <coughs> Bring everybody, including the ship, to the to the Mississippi. Establish his colony, his second primary colony. LaSalle does that, takes off, tells the people on board the bell, stay put, I'll be gone ten days, I'll come back and I'll get you. And so the people on board the bell sit there and, and wait. And the ten days come and go, and soon it's a couple weeks and three weeks. And uh, they're running low on water, so they send their best sailors ashore in their only uh, longboat that they have. And those people never come back. The Crockway Indians were hostile to the French at this time, and they probably got those guys, and so they never came back. And so from the journal of Henri Jutel, we find out that the people on board the ship sat on that ship waiting for LaSalle to come back. Time went on, and he didn't come back, and people actually began to die of thirst. 
on board Lobel. Now, the captain of the, of the ship, uh, he controlled everything. And so, uh, Andre Jutel in that journal says, well, the captain took control of the brandy and the wine, and he was drunk every day. Otherwise, he never dying. An absolute total chaos was raining on board Lobel at this time. And things got so bad, they decided they're going to violate LaSalle's orders, they're going to pull anchor, and they're going to go around and go to the Fort St. Louis colony and get help. As they do that, in February of uh, 1686, 333, 34 years ago, they uh, do that, a strong cold front blows in, one of our blue northers, they lose control of Lobel, and it wrecks right here uh, on the beach, close to Manwater Peninsula. Of the 27 people, only six people are still alive. They eventually make their way over to Magorda Peninsula. They stay here for two months until one day, miraculously, an Indian canoe washes up on shore. They get in it, and they travel all over to tell about the loss of LaBelle. Go back to Fort St. Louis. LaSalle comes back, hasn't found the Mississippi River, and hears that his last ship, LaBelle, his lifeline is gone, and his colony is on the absolute edge of total failure. He's got to do something dramatic. He needs help. So he decides he's going to walk to Canada and get help. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. This is a whole So um, and, uh, the, the following year, he leaves uh, Fort St. Louis with 17 men headed towards Canada to get uh, help. As you can imagine, his men are really unhappy with him. Nothing's working out. They get into a big argument about how much ration the food they're getting. Some of the men think they're not getting enough, and this takes place. Have you seen Nika? He is drifting away. They shoot LaSalle, and they kill him. And we're very fortunate to have this 300-year-old video. <laughs> This is a, uh, um, I worked at the Bullock Bullock Museum for a period of time, putting their exhibit together. And this is a, a, a little movie we put together. It's called Shipwreck at the, the, the theater that tells about the history of the cell with actors. And we actually went to Virginia and hired actors and put the whole thing together. So that's where, obviously, where the video came from. It's, it's, it's pretty accurate what happened to LaSalle. So he was shot. Uh, Near Navasota, Texas, uh, his, he was thrown, his body was thrown into the woods and the weeds and, and, and he was not buried. They stole his clothing and six people eventually continued the journey all the way up to Quebec, got on a ship and sailed back to France, including Henri Jutel. He was one of the, the 300 colonists that came over, one of the six people that survived and traveled back to France with Jutel, who had been keeping a daily journal of the whole expedition. He got back to France, and in 1713, he published his uh, uh, account. And that journal has been translated into English, and those of you that are interested in it, it's an amazing first-hand account of uh, a series of experiences that he had that are unbelievable but absolutely true. And in this uh, journal, he also has a map in the back part of it. Uh, and here is the, the map, and you can see that he finally, at the very end, the Mississippi River is flowing in its correct position, and here's North America, and I'm going to blow this area right here up. And here's what his final thinking was about the Mississippi River and Managorda Bay. Here's Managorda Bay, and somewhere in Managorda Bay is a channel of the Mississippi River that connects the two. And even at the very end, he was insisting that that had to be what was the, the case. So, finishing up the history part of this, the Cronco Indians attacked Fort St. Louis after LaSalle had left. The colonists were weakened by smallpox and were massacred. A few children were taken as captive, which was very common by the Indians back then, to raise the, the young European children to be Indian children. Off the coast of Veracruz, Spain captured a pirate ship. And on board that pirate ship were a few of LaSalle's men that defected and became pirates, including Denise Tomas. And poor Tomas realized that he was in bad trouble. And so he thought, well, I'm going to tell Spanish about LaSalle and what he's doing to be, maybe they'll free me. So he tells them, well, Sal's coming over to establish a colony in the part of the New World that Spain claimed, and that uh, he wanted them to know about it. 
uh, Spain got this information, executed Denise Tomas. <laughs> that information made its way back to the Council of the Indies in, in Spain, and it terrified the Spanish crown and all of his advisors. That was the, the, the aggressive King Louis XIV was now trying to build a colony in the King of Spain's dominion in the New World. And there's a document that says that if they didn't stop La Salle and his French thorn, as they called it, being plucked into the heart of America, they thought they could lose all of their possessions in, in, um, in, North America, in North America, in South America as well. And the reason for that is that King Louis XIV was very flamboyant, but very aggressive monarch, and, and Spain feared him greatly. So that started a series of 11 expeditions by land and by sea to find La Salle in his colony and to stop it. They had no idea that the colony had been massacred and, and that La Salle was dead. And so those expeditions took place and finally, in 1689, General Alonso de Leon finds the remains of Fort St. Louis. And here's the map that he made of his expedition, leaving Coahuila, uh, Mexico, traveling on up. Each little letter here, it's hard to see, is a stop as they made his way up. And this is uh, what today's Matagorda Bay. Let me blow that up. And so here, uh, F, they found the French fort. But they also found the remains of Lobel wrecked but still sticking out of the water. And on the map, they, they, they label it Navio Cuidado, broken ship, shipwreck. Mm -hmm. So this is the document that we modern archaeologists have used to back, actually back in 1995 to say, hey, let's go out and try to find that ship. And we said, look how similar it is to Matagorda Bay. That's got to be in Matagorda Bay. And there, there's its location. So switch gears now. We're going to talk about how you find a shipwreck in, in uh, the waters along the Texas coast. And the way we do that, we use a magnetometer, this thing right here. It's like a super sensitive metal detector. It can pick up one one millionth of the magnetic force it takes to move a compass needle. Very, very sensitive. And shipwrecks uh, and, and, and ships all have iron on them, and iron is, is magnetic. And so this instrument can help us find those things below the water. And so we take uh, the, the magnetometer here, and we drag it behind the, uh, the boat, and we go in a zigzag fashion and we record the different uh, targets that we find, what we call anomalies, magnetic anomalies. And we did that in July of 1995. And when we finished it, we had all these different targets. And we said, okay, here's the most probable one, or the best one, here's the next best one, and so forth. And we went out. And it turned out that the, most, the best one, we sent the divers on down. Here's how we recorded things back then. We, we were so excited. This, this back in 1995 was state-of-the-art technology. <laughs> now it looks like uh, it should be an exhibit in the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> but uh, anyways, we sent the divers down. And I should say that uh, Managorda Bay and the bays along the Texas coast have zero visibility. <clears throat> I mean, you can't see anything down there. Uh, the water wasn't deep here, about 12 feet deep where this target was, but the visibility was terrible. And so, and you never know when you go into the ground, you get to the of the water, and you're looking at what the shipwreck is. Is it a shrimp boat from 10 years ago, and maybe some nets and stuff like that down there? It could be dangerous. So typically in these kinds of projects, we would employ students. We send the students down the first So the students went down, and, uh, and they were feeling around, they said, hey, do you think we were feeling the, uh, the, uh, the loops uh, on, a, on a cannon? They said, really? Wow, that means it's an older shipwreck, and maybe the cannon will have some writing on it to help us understand what it is. And so we worked to uh, free the cannon and bring it up, and uh, sometime later we brought up this beautiful bronze cannon. And here it is, uh, and right up here, there's French lettering. And it has the insignia of the Comte de Vermandois, the Admiral of France. He was Admiral of France from 1669 to 1683. This was the confirmation that we had found of Lobel, because there aren't any other French ships in Manigora Bay. And the timing was just about right, because in 1663, 1664, LaSalle was getting its supplies ready to come to the New World. We also did some additional research and found out that the Comte de Vermandois was made the Admiral of France when he was two years old by King Louis XIV. And further research shows that his mother was a mistress of King Louis XIV. And that's how he legit
legitimized his illegitimate son. <laughs> or at least kept his mistress happy, I guess. <laughs> and in the middle part here, the uh, lifting handles from the cannon that the divers uh, felt in the, in the mud are actually uh, in the shape of uh, leaping dolphins. And the very bottom is a royal crest of King Louis XIV. A beautiful piece of art in addition to being a functioning artillery piece. This cannon is on display at the Maritime Museum in Rockport. To get a chance to see it, it's well worth seeing. Uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, armament. So, the bell was discovered. And it's turned out, uh, we had no idea, it's turned out to be one of the major shipwreck discoveries in the world. Uh, I've been over to France giving lectures. In uh, June, I'm going to Istanbul to give a lecture. They're bringing in uh, uh, scholars from around the world that have worked on all the major shipwrecks, the Mary Rose, the Vasa. I'll be presenting on, on, on the bell. And uh, so it's, it's really been recognized as being something very, very important. So when we found the ship in 1995, we said that there's probably some good stuff down there. Uh, the visibility is terrible. You can, in a traditional underwater excavation, you can, you can work in zero visibility conditions, but it's difficult. And so we decided we would do something that had never been done in this hemisphere before for an archaeological project. And that's build a steel coffer dam around it and pump the water out. So we got together with our engineers and they said, here's what you need to do. You need to build it with the sheet piling. It needs to go down uh, 35 feet in the Matagorda Bay so water doesn't wick up underneath. And you need two balls of it. We need to put the special sand in here and, uh, and put a top on it and we can pump the water out. And they said that it's going to cost you about $700,000. Well, we, we said, okay, we're going to take the gamble because we don't know how much we're going to find down there. But we think it's worth it, and let's go ahead and do it. And so we started, and $1.75 million later, we <laughs> uh, But here's what it looked like. a self-contained little island in the middle of Matagorda Bay. Uh, we excavated there from 1996 to 1997, from September of 96 to about April of 97. During those seven months or so, it was one of the most exciting archaeological projects taking place anywhere in the world, right here in, in our backyard. An amazing project. And it was interesting, the um, engineer said that inside the coffer dam, uh, it's going to leak. You can't make a watertight structure out there. Uh, so you're going to have to have sump pumps down there that were working uh, 24 hours a day to keep up with the leakage through the, the, the wall of the uh, uh, coffer dam. And I should mention that the sheet piling we had to have it specially manufactured in Pennsylvania and sent down here by barge. And the sand that was put in here is a special sand that has a property that when it gets wet it compresses and, and, and minimizes the seepage of water into the coffer dam. But the most important part of this was right here we had a diesel engine that was generating electricity 24 hours a day to uh, support the uh, sump pumps that were down in, in here. And uh, a couple times, we had, as you know, we had bad storms here from time to time. I remember one time I came out and I found dead fish on top of here. The waves had been so high, they, they threw fish up on top of the, the roof of the copper dam. Uh, and we lost, a couple times we lost electrical generation and water did start to fill up in the uh, copper dam. But pretty quickly we got the generators going again and brought the, uh, the level on down. <coughs> Uh, in addition to the generators and the fuel tanks, we had a building where we would uh, uh, had our computers and other uh, supplies. Uh, and every night, uh, one of the crew members had to spend the night out there to guard the, uh, the coffer dam. Uh, here, we, we screened all the sediments that we were digging, all the dirt to get artifacts. And here's a big uh, crane for lifting heavy objects out. And here's our vessel uh, that uh, took us back and forth from Palacios. Our uh, headquarters were in flashes for this project. So what did we find? Well, uh, we found the bottom third of Laville. And in here are, it's hard to see here, but these are boxes and barrels. And if you count the little beads we found and the, and the lead shot or what we, or bullets, we found 1.8 million artifacts on that ship. Uh, the artifacts really represent a, uh, a, what I call a kit for building a colony in the New World. The only place in the world that the objects that an explorer needed to take to the New World have been found together where you can you know, <coughs> research them and understand them and study them and figure out what they thought they needed to build a colony in, in the New World. 
this, this photograph here uh, was a centerfold for an article in National Geographic magazine. <clears throat> and uh, I remember when we, uh, when we set up for this, we spent the whole day cleaning up the coffer dam. It never looked this clean when we were working down there. <laughs> and then uh, our photographer said, we got to wait till sunset, and here's our vessel in the background. And then these lights here, they strobe for a second. They weren't normally strobing like that. We didn't work at nighttime, we worked in the daytime. But it made for just an amazing uh, picture. <clears throat> and I'm somewhere right there, I'm right there. So when we started excavating, we found out that uh, uh, we had not only iron and, 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 and durable objects, but we had organic materials. This is rope, anchor rope right here. We found 900 linear anchor, feet of anchor rope on the ship. We began to realize that the uh, what had happened is that LaBelle had, had ran aground and then a storm came in and drove the hull down into the mud and mud came in and encapsulated the bottom third of, of the hull and created an anaerobic environment that allowed for preservation of uh, organic materials that you normally don't see. So we have uh, here the rope. Uh, and the rope was in the middle of the bow, coiled up there. And in the middle of that uh, rope, we found a human skeleton. He's laying on his stomach with his arms out. Here's his skull. And here is his adult male, about 45 years old. Here's a little water cask. Probably one of the people that died of thirst on board LaBelle. And during his final hours, he was up in the, uh, the coil of rope. That was his mattress. And he, he perished up in that area. And around him in that area, we found not only did he die there, but he was living. Uh, up there. LaBelle was a small ship, 54 feet long, 17 feet wide, uh, had a single deck, and the passengers on board that ship, your options were you could be out on the deck, uh, and when the weather was bad, you went down below and you would sit on cargo. Down below. There were, only the captain had a little quarter. The captain would be there and maybe a priest or somebody of high status, but everybody else you would find your different places to uh, live. And so this guy was living in the uh, in the bow of the ship, on top of the anchor rope. This is one of his shoes, a leather shoe. <laughs> a little cup was found next to him. And on it is uh, his, the, what we think is his name, C. Barrage. And then we had a uh, forensic uh, uh, sculptor uh, reconstruct his uh, uh, face. This is what he would have looked like. Uh, and we also have just completed uh, uh, collecting his DNA. We have that. And uh, the next step is going to be to try to find his today living relatives that live in France. We're hoping that will link up when we actually find some of his relatives. Uh, we think we have some leads. Barange is a, is a, a Basque name, uh, and there were some Basque living uh, in the La Rochelle and south of that area, so we have some leads and where to look for that. Now, when you're doing a shipwreck like this, and it's got iron on it, the, the iron causes uh, uh, a process in the sea where the sea sediments start forming around the iron objects and it's called concretions and it makes it difficult to free objects sometimes so we're not down there with just teaspoons and you know little toothbrushes and stuff like that we have to use more um, indelicate tools chisel things were loose to get them out of there. We did a lot of that. But it was an amazing experience to be down there working on that shipwreck because every day we would discover a new barrel or box and we'd open it up, there'd be something else that was amazing in there. Uh, I don't have time to talk about a lot of the artifacts, but I'll highlight a few things. We found several uh, barrels. You can see the barrel here. We've taken these staves off. There's the barrel. And inside of it are axe heads. Uh, we found over 800 axe heads. Um, we found no handles for the axes. Uh, and Sal realized that he could make the handles in the New World, and his cargo space is limited, but he couldn't make the axe heads. We brought him as many over as he possibly could. And so here's an example of one of the axe heads we found. 
we found that dishes for uh, uh, holding uh, wine and beverages and stuff like that. This is a, a strainer for straining things out of uh, uh, fat. Uh, this is a hook for some sort of a tool. I uh, found a number of pewter plates. Pewter plates were the ideal plates for a ship because they don't break. Uh, and he brought a number of those over with him. Uh, here we see a, a, a bottom part of a wooden box and in it. There's a series of uh, colander, or the kettles, with a colander in the very center here with a floral pattern in it, a, uh, a ladle, a candlesticks up here. Uh, we found a number of uh, uh, bottles that would contain brandy or wine, and I told you about the captain that was drunk on board the ship. Uh, when LaBelle wrecked, he stayed on board the ship, saying that he was getting everything in order, Andre Jutel said he stayed on board the ship until he drank all the wine and, and brandy. And every bottle we found had been open, it was empty. And we found a number of these things. <clears throat> these are common on, on shipwrecks. Uh, we call these concretions. <clears throat> and when that marine sediment forms around an iron object, uh, it does it fairly quickly. And then the iron, in many cases, rusts away. And so we can take these things, we can crack them open, clean out the interior, or epoxy and recover what the original artifact was that inside that, that uh, concretion. And so, for example, this is one of those objects we found. It's a folding knife. That's all epoxy from pouring epoxy into the concretion and recovering what the original artifact was. Here, interestingly, uh, these are uh, uh, case knives. And here, the, uh, the knife blade is epoxy uh, from a concretion. The wood preserved, that's the original wood handle. Wood preserved, iron rusted away. And this, just to show the remarkable preservation of some things, this is a piece of wax paper that was wrapped around a knife blade to keep the knife uh, sharp and from rusting when it was packaged in, in uh, France. Here are some buttons for a uh, shirt or a uniform with crochet material on them. Here's part of a uniform, as you can see. Here is a, a, a box that I excavated. It's about three feet this way, a foot this way, and a foot deep. And it was packed with nothing but glass beads to trade to the Indians. Over 600,000 glass beads. Probably the beads were, we haven't tested, they were made in Venice. Uh, brought over, probably never unpacked uh, this particular box. And they were actually strung by color. You can see white ones here, and blue ones over here, and black ones over here. And as they excavated on down, the string was still present, holding the beads together in strands. And we found a lot of these. Uh, these are the egg cases for cockroaches. This ship was teeming with cockroaches. And we found a lot of uh, the bones of the ship rat. And uh, back in those days, you just lived with those things. You probably never thought twice. If they got into, cockroaches got into your flour, you just got them out of there and you eat the flour and you ate it. Cook with you. And at the very bottom, at uh, the very end, we got to the bottom of the ship here, and you can see the bottom third of the bell. It uh, doesn't look like it to hold all those uh, barrels and boxes, 86 barrels and boxes, including uh, that held the 1.8 uh, million artifacts. But we cleaned them all out, and then the, the most important artifact, the hull of the ship, we decided we would dismantle it timber by timber and, and send it off to be treated at Texas A&M University. The uh, coffer dam set up so the public could come and dock and, and look over and watch what we were doing. Uh, state government uh, put a lot of public money into this. We wanted the public to have the opportunity to see what we were doing. And so we had 25,000 people that, that, that took a boat ride out to see what we were doing, doing during those six months. And uh, so when we were down below here, there were almost always were people up above. And I remember one time when it was a cold day and we didn't have, well, they had a, a a father looked like a young girl, probably his daughter. And I remember I could hear uh, his daughter asking, what do they feed the archaeologists? <laughs> and uh, I was thinking, I think, I think she's confused. 
confused. This is sort of a zoo for uh, geologists. <laughs> All the artifacts we found, uh, the seawater, uh, the water of Vandenberg Bay had become the, 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 the element that was preserving them. And so none of them could be dried out. We had to immediately, every time we excavated something, we had to put it into uh, a vat of water. If you were putting a, uh, one of our timbers from the hull into a vat of water, and then we actually shipped all of the uh, artifacts to Texas a and University for conservation in water. And then they used the various treatments and techniques to be able to uh, allow them to be air dried. If you didn't do that, uh, the wood would warp and disintegrate and deteriorate and you'd lose artifacts. Here at Texas A&M University, they're in the process of uh, cleaning the, uh, the timbers. Uh, and then we put Lobel back together and we soaked it in uh, polyethylene glycol, uh, synthetic wax as the first stages of, of uh, preservation. It's a petroleum product, uh, very good for doing this. <clears throat> and we did that for several years, and, 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 poly uh, and polyethylene glycol has another property. Uh, for those of you, and probably everybody here has, has had that prep work before you have a colonoscopy, they give you a, a peg, what's it called. <laughs> So it's got multiple purposes. It's also a great, it's a great preservative and it's used in many ladies' cosmetics. Um, so anyways, we did that for a period of time and the price of oil was skyrocketing and this became too expensive. So to finish up the uh, preservation of LaBelle's hull, we built a freeze dryer, uh, the largest freeze dryer ever built for archaeological specimens at College Station. And it was built so that the, uh, the length of it, about uh, uh, 45 feet would be the longest piece of, of wood that we had to go in there. And we finished up Lobel's treatment by freeze drying it, just like you would with make coffee, freeze dry coffee. And how that works, it works through the process of sublimation. And it takes the, uh, the, the water and you, you convert it to an ice, and then you then convert it directly, you freeze it, and then you, and then you take and convert it directly to a gas for sublimation. So uh, the best analogy for that is that probably down here it's rare, but you'll get uh, icy patches on the road and stuff like that. And some days it can be below freezing during the whole day, but that ice goes away. It's, it's going directly from a solid to a gas with sublimation. Well, we use that process in, in freeze drying, and we put the timbers in in batches, and we completed the uh, uh, preservation of all, of all those timbers. And this is a model of Lobel to give you an idea what the whole ship would have looked like, made by a French uh, uh, shipbuilder, a model shipbuilder in uh, Paris, that he put this together. It's very accurate based upon our archaeological information and also documents that we found about the ship in uh, France. The many artifacts from the Lobel shipwreck are down in this area at several museums in what we call the LaSalle Odyssey, but many of the artifacts are at the Bullock Museum where we've opened up the big exhibit there. Uh, in, in the major atrium of the museum, you'll see uh, the Hall of LaBelle down here. This is a, an artist's sketch of it. It actually looks better than that. Uh, but it's, we took the timbers from LaBelle from Texas A&M. We brought them to Texas, to the Bullock Museum, Texas State History Museum. And myself and one other person, we put the timbers together as a live exhibit in 2014 and 2015 and had over 200,000 people come in and see us doing that. And then when we finished that, they've come in now and they've put in this 25-foot uh, high display case showing all the different artifacts that we found and what they mean. We have a video of the excavation and other display cases around it. Uh, if you get a chance to get to Austin, it's well worth seeing. It's a great final exhibit that they uh, that we've put together on, on the shipwreck. We've written three books about LaBelle. The first one is From a Watery Grave, the Discovery and Excavation of the South Shipwreck LaBelle. LaBelle, the ship that changed history. And then finally, the most recent one, LaBelle, the Archaeology of the 17th Century Ship of New World Colonization. That one is 900 pages. It's got all the details on everything on the excavation. It's a big, big, big book. It's a great book if uh, you're awake at night and you want something to put you to sleep. That's <laughs> really good too. Okay, so the final part of my lecture here, I'm going to talk about a few more stories from Bell. What are some of the more unusual or interesting things that occurred during the excavation, or what did we learn about uh, what was going on? 
The first one is LaSalle's real motive for coming to Texas. He wanted to build a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River and, and hold on to that claim for France of, of all the land that the Mississippi drained. But he also had another objective that King Louis XIV gave him, and that was to look at and invade the silver mines that Spain had in northern Mexico. As I mentioned earlier, King Louis XIV wasn't satisfied with beaver pellets. He wanted gold and silver. He wanted this stuff right here. And at that time, Spain was getting 60% of its New World wealth from the silver mines in northern uh, today's Mexico, back then New Spain. And La Salle's orders were to do reconnaissance and to see how far and what it would take to invade and take over that, that, those silver mines. Uh, and La Salle did do that. Uh, we have a, a evidence of the, the Indians up in this area here. They recorded to the Spanish who were living at this presidio that uh, these men came that looked like the Spanish and they were asking the, uh, the Indians how far was it to the silver mines, uh, how good were the roads, and how well guarded were the silver mines. So they, this clearly was a, a motive of what was or a major objective of the Salas expedition. But as we saw, the Salas colony fell apart and terrible things happened. And this dropped out as an objective uh, ultimately towards the end and, and was never really realized. But on board La Belle, we did find a few artifacts that was how brought with them so that if he encountered the Spanish, uh, he'd have arms against them. These are petards, and uh, they had should have handles. The handles are broken off here. And basically, they would be horizontal, and you'd use the handles to tie them onto a, a door of a, of a Spanish fort that you wanted to break through. And you'd put gunpowder uh, in here, and there's a hole over here, and you'd have a fuse and you'd light the fuse and blow up the gunpowder, and these would blow open the doors of a Spanish settlement to break in. You also had these little uh, fire pots here, <clears throat> and these things you would put gunpowder in here, this grenade would be in, in there, and gunpowder in there, and then there would be, and this would be inside, and then there would be a fuse that comes through here, this is the lid of it, and the fuse would come up here, and go through this little wooden stopper here, and come on out, and basically the way these would work is that you would light the fuse, and if you had a, a stockade or a palisade around a Spanish a, a presidio, you could throw these over, and the gunpowder would go off and smash the uh, ceramics, and you have shrapnel basically or, you know, flying around, and then when people came out to try to see what was going on, the grenade would go off next and send the uh, remains of the iron uh, grenade in all different directions. Uh, very vicious weapons. These objects we found on the very bottom of the cargo hold of La Belle. They were in places very inaccessible. By the time La Belle uh, wrecked, uh, this was the last thought that they had that they would ever use these things. And they never did. How did La Belle change history? Well, when La Salle came over here, Spain didn't have anybody in Texas. Spain claimed this on, on a map of the world, but they had no people up here. Um, and so uh, when Spain heard about this and heard about the French and said, whoa, if we don't do something, uh, that part of our, our territory is going to become French. And so as a result of La Salle, they sent uh, uh, people up to build the missions and the soldiers build the presidios. And that started uh, moving towards Texas' wonderful Hispanic community we have today. If La Belle had not wrecked in that storm in 1686 and had been successful, our heritage here in Texas may be French, like New Orleans. It just goes to show how history can change on a dime. Here, the sinking of the ship changed it from a course that could be French to a course that ended up being uh, Spanish and resulting in our Hispanic heritage today. Who owns La Belle? When we excavated the ship uh, and finished it in 1997, uh, we got uh, the Texas governor, uh, George Bush, got a claim uh, that had been sent to him from the State Department from the Republic of France saying, they own the ship. And we said, well, how can that be? And they said, well, uh, Archivist found this document in Rochefort, which is the, the, the city where La Belle was built, not too far from La Rochelle on the western coast. And they said, we found this, this book, and, uh, and it says, Vessels of the King in the Department of Rochefort, and right here is La Belle. And so it says right there is La Belle, 50 ton of capacity, 
six cannons in the department of Rochefort where it was built. The shipwright who built her, who oversaw it, was Henri Montpellier. Draft seven feet. And here is a note saying, Mr. De La Salle has taken her to Mexico from which she has not yet returned. <laughs> so the Republic of France said this was a ship owned by King Louis XIV and the Republic of France took everything that the monarchs had and it's part of the patrimony of, of France today and they claimed it. And there's one other notation here and that's, that's interesting. Right here it says the number of crew members is not given because, for this vessel because the pilot who just returned says that she no longer exists. That's the pilot that was drunk on, on the ship. He was one of the six people that walked uh, uh, up to Canada, actually participated in the murder of LaSalle, but never told anybody. But he made his way down to uh, uh, Rochefort and went in and told them that the ship was gone. And they put that final notation in there about the ship being lost. So this claim, when it came over to the Texas uh, governor's office, came to my agency, the Texas Historical Commission. <clears throat> We weren't pleased about it. Uh, we'd asked France for money and they didn't give us any money. Now they're claiming everything. And not in international water, but in a bay. Uh, and we didn't really understand the, the basis for the, the claim. And uh, France was claiming it under international law of the sea. And basically, under that law, uh, a ship on official expedition always belongs to the, the, the country that, that, that sent the, uh, the, the ship on that expedition. And so, uh, therefore, that's why they claimed it. And so they submitted the, uh, the claim to the State Department. Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State at the time. She reviewed it. She talked to the U.S. Navy. Their staffs looked at it. And they concluded that, yes, France owns it. And so they kind of pulled the rug out from under us. And they said that uh, Madeleine, Madeleine, Madeleine Albright wrote a letter to the French government saying, we agree that you own it. And so that set in motion our generating and putting together an international treaty on LaBelle. Uh, and that treaty says that uh, LaBelle, the hall, and all the artifacts do belong to France, but they stay in Texas until France and Texas both agree that they go someplace else. So they'll always be here. Always be here. And we, we signed that treaty uh, here in the treaty room at the U.S. State Department. So I'd like to think that some of the history of LaBelle was continuing to be made as we went through the, this project. <coughs> and finally, my last little story is Guru Lake Plumbing Espinola, New Mexico. And you're probably wondering, what, what is this? Uh, fun, fun little story. Um, when LaSalle was murdered, this gentleman right here, Jean the Archivec, he signaled for LaSalle to come forward while this other man, Duho, shot him and killed him. Well. These guys, particularly Jean Larchevec, realized that he couldn't be one of the ones that walked back to France because he's found out he would, he would be executed. So he decided that what he would do is after uh, LaSalle's murder, he would go live with the Caddo Indians of East Texas. And he went there. And when he was there, he met another former colonist from LaSalle that had been left there on an earlier uh, expedition by LaSalle to visit the Caddo Indians. Uh, Jacques uh, 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 Rollet had become uh, sick and so he stayed with the Caddo Indians. So these two individuals, they became friends and they lived with the Indians for two or three years and then they decided that, you know, life with the Indians is good but we want to be with other Europeans and they said, let's write a letter to the Spanish that we know are down to the southwest and then have them come and get us. And so they wrote a letter on this parchment, this exists today, uh, again in the archives in Seville, and it's a picture of a ship that they had with them, but on there they each wrote letters. You can see the letter here from Jacques Rollet and the other from John Archivec saying, we're Christians, we want to be with other Christians, please come and get us. They gave this, this parchment to some Indians who took it down to uh, the Spanish in this Presidio. The Spanish got it and said, whoa, they're a living Frenchman up there, we've got to get those guys. And so from another location in northern Spain, they sent a group of soldiers up there to get these two guys. They got them, brought them back down to uh, northern Spain, they interrogated them. I know, what the world are you doing there, and what's going on? And then they sent them down to Mexico City, and they were interrogated again. And then they were sent back uh, to Spain and put in prison. And they were in prison for a couple of years. 
And then in New Spain, uh, they needed workers for the silver mines. The, uh, the Indians had been used as slaves, and it's very, very difficult work, and they need more laborers for the silver mines. They said, well, we've got these prisoners, so let's bring them over, put them in the silver mines. So the two guys came back to Mexico City, went up and worked the, uh, the silver mines. And then when they were there, uh, in 1680, Spain had been up in, uh, before 1680, Spain had been up in New Mexico. And during the Pueblo Revolt, the Pueblo Indians kicked the Spanish out of uh, New Mexico. Well, in, in 1692, De Vargas had an expedition to resettle uh, uh, New Mexico. And they were looking for people to come with them, and they decided they'd ask some of these, these uh, people working in silver mines who had been prisoners if they wanted to come. And obviously they said yes. And so our two individuals made their way up uh, with the Vargas to Santa Fe, and they stayed up there. And they married, and they started families. And they changed their names from Jacques Roulet to and John Larchebeck to the Hispanicized Santiago Roulet and Juan Arcebeque. And today, if you go north of Santa Fe in Española, you'll see this wonderful sign, Roulet Plumber. That's a descendant of one of those Alice colonists who first came to uh, the New World through Texas. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Cliff, do we have time for just a few questions? You bet. Yeah. Okay, any, any sure. questions? How far was it from Flashes to Oriola? Like, how far did you ride? Hour and 15 minutes each way. Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we had some terrible storms out there that we went out through and out in. And I remember when the National Geographic uh, article, the people working on that, the writer came out with the photographer. It was one of those really stormy days. And the crew wasn't working out there, but we had to get her out there to see things to write her article. And so we went out out there and we came on back. We had terrible back and that uh, rider when she got on the deck and flashes at her, her dock there, uh, first thing she did was kiss the ground. <laughs> <laughs> she made it back. Oh, I... That's cute. Yes, sir. How long, how, how long is the vessel? 50, 54 feet long, small. The Santa Juan is a small, shallow graph vessel that went here, so when he got here, he could explore the Mississippi River and coastal areas. So that's why it was so small. Yes. Hi, I'm curious first why you didn't use Port O'Connor since it's a whole lot closer. We approached Port O'Connor and uh, uh, we couldn't get things to work out. There wasn't a facility that was big enough there and while we were trying to do that, the city of Palacios got together and said, hey, we have a, uh, a marina that's no longer being used, we'll give it to you for free and they offered us all kinds of uh, incentives for us to go that way. So we'd have been closer <laughs> there, but we wanted to make it work, but we just couldn't get things to work out. I nearly lost a 46-foot sailboat at almost the exact location. I used to live, when I was a graduate student here, I used to live on a 46-foot engine on a sailboat. And I would sail up an anchor right off the old Air Force base on Matagorda Island. And one time in the summer I did that, and I was fairly near shore. A squall came through with north winds, broke our anchor out, mm. and I had no engine. I had to decide try to get under sail or get another anchor out. I got another anchor out, and it held less than 10 feet to where we would have gone aground and been ruined. Wow. So it's really, I think that's the main reason there's so many ancient shipwrecks mm -hmm. inside of bays because they didn't have that good of an anchor. No. And if, the, if their anchor breaks out, they can't get a square rigger under sail fast, they're done for. And the yeah. bays all over the world are full of old shipwrecks for that reason. Lavelle normally had two anchors and it had lost one of its anchors and so when the storm came in, they had a single anchor, and it was enough to stop the ship. In fact, they threw the anchor out, uh, and the ship dragged backwards, going backwards in the storm, and that's how we found it with the, the bow pointing north. If it drew seven feet, do you have any idea why it was so far offshore in the bay and was much deeper in water? I don't know. I don't I, know. I wondered about yeah. that. You know, maybe with the when those, those cold fronts come through, they, they push the water out of the bay, so maybe it was a little bit shallower when they came through. Yeah. Uh, 12 feet deep today, the bay is. Yeah. And so those are French feet, so they'd actually about, be about 8 feet, but you get ran around there. Yes? When you built the topper dam, were you concerned that any of the debris from the vessel might have drifted beyond the boundaries of the dam? 
we we did, but uh, fortunately, when the bell wrecked, everything stayed together in the hall and it went down. And we actually did uh, surveys around it and found. Uh, there, there was very little there, and when we excavated LaBelle, we excavated around it and found very few objects outside the hull. We were lucky because mostly, most shipwrecks uh, occur and the ship breaks apart and everything gets scattered everywhere. Here, everything was together. In fact, it was amazing. We could look at the pattern of how the barrels and boxes were interlaced and locked together in that ship so that when the ship was moving, they stayed with the hull. Yeah? What variety of wood? Is in the flagging and the ribs. Most of it was French oak. Yeah. Did you find any money or coins or anything? We found a single coin. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were 2,000 silver coins, but when that ship wrecked, those six survivors went for those coins. <laughs> Even though they were worthless in, 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 you know, in Texas and the, the, the New World back then, we found a single coin. And that's been an interesting story. When we found it, we couldn't tell what it was. When uh, we sent it to Texas A&M, it took them about a year to clean it up. And they called me back one day and said, you won't believe what the coin is. It's a Roman coin dated to AD 59. And I said, wow, that's amazing. And then subsequently we've learned that these are called jetons. They're tokens in, they were making in France, and they would make copies of Roman coins. And they would be good luck charms and things like that. So one of the soilers, sailors had one of these these tokens brought with them and lost them on board the uh, Bell. I should mention uh, an interesting thing. We found um, the remains of two individuals on board the ship. The one I showed you, and then we found the remains of a another individual that was very, very tall. And the DNA analysis that we've had recently done has said that uh, the, the, the one individual that we, I showed you the picture of here was definitely French. The other one is Caracol. That's what. And so what we, the crop were very tall people, and so what we're guessing is that when that boat, when that ship wrecked, and part of it was sticking above the water, the crop were as curious as could be about what was in there, and probably were going down into the cargo holds trying to salvage what they could, and one of them got stuck down there and perished. <coughs> That's got to be the only thing I can imagine what happened, because there were no, we know who the 27 people were that were on board the ship, and none of them were uh, Native American adults like that. We found uh, three cannons, uh, and we found the impression of a fourth. The fourth cannon, the best we can tell is that a shrimper back in the 1960s snagged it, couldn't quite bring it up and dragged it off somewhere, and it's still out there. So uh, one day maybe somebody will try to find that. The problem with the cannon, the brass and the magnetometer won't detect them, so they're harder to, to find than if it was an iron cannon. How, how big, what was the diameter of those cannons? Of the which? Of the cannons, what was the dia the biggest diameter? Four pounder ball I would use, so, you know, not a ball about that size right there. So not, not huge, but, uh, and the cannons, the bronze cannons, were not used on board the ship. They were in the cargo hold uh, being held for the Mississippi River Colony. Uh, there were actually were iron cannons on board the ship on the deck, and when the Spanish found the ship, they actually took those cannons and took them back to uh, France. I mean, to, to uh, New Spain. Were you involved in the excavation of Fort St. Louis? Yeah, okay, there were four bronze cannons on board the bill in the cargo hold. Three we found, one got dragged off by Shrimper. On the deck, there were six iron cannons that the ship used, and then at uh, Fort St. Louis, uh, and I did direct the excavation there. Uh, that was the Salas Colony. We excavated there for a couple of years. I have a, another book coming out on that. Um, when uh, De Leon found Fort St. Louis in 1689, after the French had been killed by the Indians, they found uh, eight iron cannons that uh, were guarding the settlement. Those iron cannons had come from the ship that, that uh, ran aground trying to come into a pass the bayou uh, that I showed earlier. Before they brought the ship in, they tried to lighten it and they took off the cannons. Those cannons made their way to uh, uh, Fort St. Louis, guarded the settlement. When the Spanish came, they got those uh, uh, cannons and they couldn't bring them back then to New Spain, so they buried them in the ground with the idea they'd come back and get them. Well, it took them 32 years later to come back. They built a presidio over the range of the French uh, fort, but they forgot that the cannons were there. And then in 1996, one day when I was working at the Texas Historical Commission, 
I got a call from this man from the Kieran Ranch. He was the, uh, the, 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 the the manager of the ranch. And he said, I was out metal detecting out there and I found the ball end of a cannon. And I said, you know, my career at the Historical Commission, I got these calls a lot. And none of them turned out to be anything. <laughs> but on this one, I thought, well, maybe there's something to it. So we went down there. And sure enough, he had found the pit where the eight iron cannons were located. And those iron cannons are on display today in the Museum of the Coastal Bend in Victoria. Uh, amazing that they're in beautiful shape. They, they preserved really well on that clay soil at the uh, site where they were found. Okay, I'll take one more question and we'll call it quits. Uh, I just wondered, since uh, French uh, made claim to the the ship, does that include all the artifacts? All the artifacts. Wow. So if you go around, uh, there should be uh, somewhere in the, the, all the displays in, in Victoria or whatever, if they have stuff from LaBelle, should be a little sign that says, uh, the property of France. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I should say that the, the entity in Paris that had the jurisdiction was their uh, uh, museum uh, uh, that had a, uh, right on the Seine River overlooking the Eiffel Tower. So we had really tough meetings over there talking to them about what we were doing. So, okay, thank you all very much for coming out.